Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Adams from Pro Writing Aid, and today I'm joined by Christina Stanley. She is the best-selling author of the Stone Mountain Mystery Series. She also has many years of experience as a professional editor, and most recently she is the creative force behind the Fictionary Editing Software. So welcome, Christina. We're so glad to have you here with us. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here today. All right, so Christina is going to do a walkthrough of the Fictionary software for all of us today. So I am going to just hand the reins over to her and I'm just going to go off camera and learn with the rest of you. Okay, terrific. Thanks for the introduction, Michelle. It's always fun to be working together with Pro Writing Aid and we've been doing it for years now. I'm not sure if everybody knows who's on the call that Pro Writing Aid works directly inside of Fictionary and that's why we have such a tight relationship with each other and do lots of these events together and so when Lisa asked me to come and do a demo of Fictionary of course I said yes I would love to. So what I'm going to do today I'm going to do show two main things and the first thing I'm going to show is um, uh, how you edit a, a manuscript that you have a draft of. And then the second thing I'm going to show is how to outline if you're starting from scratch. And so you can do both within Fictionary. And we started out mainly as an editing tool and then got a, a, a push from our writers that people wanted to outline and write there too. So we added that, of course, because that's what people wanted us to do. Um, so uh, I think Michelle put up that we have a, a discount going. Um, I'm sure she can share the link for everybody. It's 40% off for all Pro Writing Aid users. And um, what I want to mention about that is you still get a two-week free trial. Sometimes when people start, they think they're in the trial and don't get a coupon, but we give everybody a two-week free trial whether or not a coupon is used. So that's there. And the coupon code is PWA2021. So with that, I'm going to start. What I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off my video because my computer gets too slow if I'm running that and our app at the same time, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'm just going to get straight going into a demo, and I'll turn my video back on when we have a Q&A session. Also note, while I'm doing the demo, I can't see the questions, so Michelle or Amy are going to monitor those for me, and they can either break in or they can, we'll, do, we'll answer them at the end. Okay, so I will share my screen. Okay, so Michelle, I assume you're just gonna pop on and tell me if you cannot see my Fictionary bookshelf. If you can, that's great. Yes, everything looks good. Terrific, okay. So where we're starting here, what I wanna show first is, is the first thing you need to do when using the Fictionary app is import your manuscript. And so to do that, you can do it, you can um, sign up for a free trial on our fictionary.co website. And um, then from there, you'll be taken right through the import manuscript process. So I'm just gonna show it here because I have an account open. So what I'm gonna do is import another manuscript onto the bookshelf. And here, the first thing that comes up is it asks me to select a file. And so I select a docx file, which of course I can't see because the bar is in my way. There we go. And I just choose it. I'm going to rename it so that I know this is the one I'm importing and not the evolution for demo I'm about to use after this. So when you import, the first thing we do is we ask you how your manuscript is, is uh, imported or sorry, is formatted. And here's really the first place Fictionary technology helps you in your writing process. The industry standard for a novel is to start each chapter with the word chapter, and it's also reader expectation. So by doing this prior to editing your novel, you're really setting yourself up for success. So mine is, my manuscript has chapters. Some, some writers use heading one, some use both, and some don't use either. So there's different ways to, to go through the import process. This is the easiest way. The next thing is to look at how the manuscript is formatted based on scenes. And a scene break character is the character that goes in between the scenes to mark that a scene has ended and a new scene is beginning. And reading technology has made this a must for formatting a manuscript. The devices people read on has influenced how we read our stories and therefore how we format our stories. And the device size is very between ebooks, not like a print book where you always knew where the end of a page was. 
in any electronic device, you never know where the scene break is going to occur. And if it happens at the bottom of a page, the reader has no indication that a new scene is going to start and therefore might get confused. So this is the second way storyteller is pushing you to, to format in a way that's going to help your readers. So then I just move forward and here, the scene break character I use is a tilde. You can use stars, um, whatever text character you want that's unique in your manuscript. And then I continue to import it. And so right now what's happening is Fictionary is organizing the manuscript into chapters and scenes. It's creating a character list using natural language processing. It's linking those characters to scenes. So you'll be able to see who is in each scene. It's drawing the story arc, the word count per scene and the scenes per chapter insight. And then it takes you to the confirm characters page. So this is where we're at here. The Fictionary Storyteller has structured your story into chapters and scenes for you. And so you'll go on to use Storyteller as your personal intelligent assistant as you edit your story um, now that it's, it's structured for you. But before doing that, here's where you can quickly check if a manuscript has imported as you expected. And you can see that the story structure is going to help you as you edit on a scene by scene basis. So usually what I recommend is we just get click show last scene and you go down and you make sure, yep, that's the end of this novel. It generally looks like it's broken out how I expected it to break out. And then I click next. So there's not really too much to do here. Then the book, the Fictionary will tell you the book has 26 chapters, 88 scenes, and over 80,000 words. So the next thing we're going to do is look at the cast of characters that Fictionary um, brought out for you. And so Storyteller has listed all the um, character names in one place. And it's your first look at your characters in a book uh, before you start editing. And so as you see... Um, if you look at this list, it's AI based. And so it's not going to be perfect. Uh, Fictionary does its best to get it as accurate as possible. And so what we've done is we have enabled it so that um, you can update the, the character list. So I'm going to just click I'm done for now at this point. And then what I want to do, I have set up on the bookshelf um, a separate novel that I've, I've set up for this demo. So I want to uh, show you that and show you the cast of characters from there as we go through and, and do a sample edit of a story. So to find the cast of characters, you can go here at any time and update it at any time. You just click cast of characters. And you can do everything you need to do with the cast of characters. So for example, Aragost is actually a food menu. It's not a character in this novel. And um, where are we looking here? So we'll pick something else. Let's just say, well, let's just say Apollo is, Apollo is actually a dog. So we'll delete him. You can click as many as you want, and then you can delete the selected characters. It deletes them permanently. So you just want to check, yep, I really want to. And by deleting them, it doesn't delete them out of your manuscript. It only means they won't show up in the insights for characters on the insight page. So we'll go ahead and delete those and then you'll see they've disappeared from the list. The other thing you can do, um, let's say that Brenda and Camilla are actually the same character, but Camilla is a middle name and you want to merge them. You can click both and then you just merge them into one of them. And then what you'll end up is one less character there. The other important things to do at the beginning is you want to set your protagonist. And the protagonist is simply the main character of the story um, that the reader is going to follow and cheer for. And in this story, the protagonist is Serafina. And so we set her. And yes, I want to set it. So we have a confirmation page here. And then here you can see my protagonist is Serafina. The other thing, in this particular book, every scene is written from her point of view. It's a single point of view character novel. And so I'm going to set that for my story. Um, once you do this, you can't undo it. So make sure you really want to do it. Okay. And the last thing we can do here is we can add a character. So you just type in the name and I'll put, I'll just call them a character with my lousy typing. And, uh, not that, and we just save it. And there you can see a character shown up here. So now 
if for some reason while you're, you, you know, it didn't show up or you're revising, you add a new character, you can always come to this page and do that. So now we're going to jump over to the evaluate page. And this is where, you know, the real work of Fictionary comes in and, and how it's going to help you add it. So just a quick overview on the left panel over here. This is the structure of your story as shown in chapters and scenes. And you can see I've put some scene names in here just to show an example. The middle panel, this is where you're actually going to edit. So you can make all your changes here. And on the right, we've got the character, the plot, and the setting, um, 38 fictionary story elements to evaluate your story against. And we also have a notes panel. So if you want to keep notes as you go, or you, you know, just little reminders for things to do, this is where you do that. All right, so we're gonna start out looking at how Fictionary helps with characters. So having a list of your characters on a scene by scene basis gives a specific method for evaluating how you're using the characters. And it shows you when you need to evaluate a scene or revise a scene, sorry. Um, and knowing who is in each scene helps you control how the reader experiences not only the scene, but the entire story. So to see who's in a scene, you click the view button and you get a list here. And so we've got Alyssa, Katie, Nick, Olivia, and Serafina. So in this scene, Nick is actually dead. So he's not a character in the scene, but he is mentioned. And if you think of, uh, so I just clicked the little arrow there and he moves over to mentioned. If you think of a, a characters in a play, the characters on the stage are in the scene. And the ones they talk about and just mention are the characters mentioned. And so you can delineate that way. And the only difference here is only the characters that are in the scene show up in the character insights. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. Um, the other thing you can do here is you can add characters to a scene. So you just click add, select a character. Let's just add Band Bandit because he's convenient. Bandit shows up in the scene. Um, and that way, as you're revising and you add new characters, you can also add them to the scene and the insights stay up to date. So really with this, you know it's time to revise a scene if there's too many characters in a scene, which might confuse a reader. Um, if a character that's introduced has too much or too little detail, if characters appear or disappear without warning, and what I mean there is sometimes a scene is written and all of a sudden a character Bob will start talking, but nobody, the reader doesn't know that that character's in the scene. These are critical things. Um, the other critical thing is that the protagonist must be in all the key story arc scenes, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And um, when you're looking at the list, you want to make sure that the names are not confusing. So say you had a character Alyssa and a character Alice, very similar names. And by seeing them here in one place, you can go, oh, that's no good. I got to rename one of them. Okay, so that's that. Now, what I'm going to do is just move over and have a look at the character insights. No, that's not, that's word count per scene. Sorry about that. It's this zoom bar that's throwing me off here. All right. So, sorry. Ugh. We'll do it this way. So we'll go to our character insights where I went visualize and then I clicked character insight, which we're not moving. Okay, there we go. Yeah, sorry, my computer gets a bit slow when I'm on Zoom for some reason. So this is the, the characters per scene insight. So, and so here, what we're doing, it's showing you how many characters are in each scene. And so really this is important because you don't want the readers to flip or click pages to find out who a character is. And this can happen if there's too many characters in the scene. And in this insight, you can see, you can scroll across and look for places where there's too many characters. So scene 25 has 11, scene 33 is getting a bit up there. So you wanna maybe start looking at those scenes. So if we then go back to the evaluate page and we look at scene 25, which is here, we can then look at who's in this scene. And you can see it's quite a bit. So the first thing we know is Nick is dead. So he's not actually in the scene and that removes, that removes one character um, altogether. But usually what I do here is I would review the scene and I look at how many characters actually need to be in this scene. And are there any that could go? Are there any that are 
performing the same function. And this is a good place to indicate that perhaps two characters could be merged into one. The fewer the characters there are, the more time there is to develop each character and the more time the reader has to connect with each character. So it's important to do that. So after revising, I would go back to the um, scenes per character report and, and have a look at, does it look better or not? So the other thing we have is the characters per scene insight. So we'll go back to the character insights and then we'll have a look at the scenes per character, which is the opposite way of, of looking at your characters. Okay, so the scenes per character insight shows you the number of scenes each character is in. So that's this number up here. And it also shows you the order they appear in the story. So Katie is the first character, Serafina the second, and so on. Um, and here it's showing us that Serafina has the most number of scenes. So the max scenes is 88. Serafina has the most, and she's the protagonist. So that's a really good thing. Nick's number will reduce as we go through and we move him over into the um, mentioned characters mentioned, or we can just leave him here because we want to see he's the guy that's killed in this book. Is he in there enough to remind the reader? So you can you can look at it two ways. This is also helpful um, when you're looking at how a character is introduced, how much, how much detail do you give that character? Um, for example, so a major character should have more description, more backstory than a minor character. And the character entry is the first time a character appears in a novel. And the character entry is the beginning of the character's arc. And we, when they exit, it's the end of the arc. And so that means, you know, for a minor character, their character arc is very short. So one of the things that you can do with this insight is look at characters who are only in one scene. So if we look over here at Janet as the first one who's only in one scene, um, then I wanna go back to the, this first, the only scene that she's in and have a look at, um, is there any way I can revise this? Do I need to use her or not? Um, so I wanna look at, did I describe her in as little detail as possible so that the reader's not confused, but they get that she's there. And to do that, we go to the cast of characters page. And on the cast of characters page, I'll just deselect these two. We'll go and find Janet. Okay, so here's Janet. And what we can do is view her first scene. So Janet, I know this because I've read the scene, is down at the bottom here. And it's the assistant. And so, um, she appears once, we mention her name once, and that's it. And so really the way to revise this scene is she doesn't even need to be in it. She's never in a scene again. She doesn't need to be, to be named like she is here. No, thanks, Janet. Well, it doesn't matter. So the two options are here, just remove the name or um, take her out altogether because she's only here once. Now let's go back to the evaluate page. So you can see, I mean, looking at a, an 80,000 word manuscript and trying to figure out how to fix it, it's really hard. Like story editing is a hard, complex task. And so what I wanna do here is just take a deeper look at the evaluate page and how Fictionary can help you with it. So as you know, Fictionary is organized your manuscript into chapters and scenes. So you can look at your story without having to keep track of your entire novel in your head or scrolling up and down in a Word document, for example. So you can work on each scene, evaluating the character, the plot and the setting, giving you a structured process that will lead you to the final scene. So let's just have a look at, um, we'll go to scene, back to scene one here. So we'll look at characters. Um, so here we've got 38 elements. If you're feeling a little overwhelmed, you can hit the advanced mode button and it goes down to, uh, 15 of the key elements if you want to start there um, just to make things a little bit easier. So we'll look at a scene from uh, the character perspective. So in this scene we've already looked at who's here and Nick is mentioned. Um, point of view character is Serafina. You can reset it to anybody else if you decide you're changing who the point of view is or if you write multiple points of view and Fictionary didn't quite get it right you can change it here. So in this case, Serafina's goal, because she's the, the 
uh, point of view character is to make it through the funeral. I'm gonna come back to the character arc in a second. It's, it's a super interesting um, insight uh, that's new to fictionary, but has some valuable input for characters. Um, the point of view girl, goal internal may or may not be known to the reader. And in this book, it's not yet, but, but Seraphine is a bit suicidal. And so that's her internal goal, which of course we wanna change. Is it related to the plot? I know this because I wrote it. Her goal though right now is just to make it to the funeral. And she is a character who is, um, she likes to be isolated. She's an introvert. She loses friends and family because of it. And so if she can't be at her own husband's funeral, she's gonna alienate her friends and family. And that's important to her. The impact on her and she is the protagonist is negative. What she learns is Alyssa, who she hasn't seen in 10 years, is at her funeral. So here, you only want to put key things that are relevant to the story that you want to remember. And then are the characters in motion is important because motion adds pacing. And so if the characters are too static, there's the, the scene will feel slow. And so you want to make sure there's motion in every scene. On the plot side, so I've named this funeral. Now I try and name every scene in three words or less, not including little words like as or if, because if I can, I know my scene is focused. If I can't, it's probably not focused and maybe it needs to be two scenes or it, or it needs to be written a lot tighter. In this case, it's not one of the key story arc scenes. So we leave the story arc set to no. And the purpose of this scene is really to introduce Serafina as the protagonist. But you can choose all kinds of things, or you can add a different purpose, depending on your genre. You might have specifics, like in a romance, it might be meeting the partner. So we'll just leave it as character introduction. These ones, the opening and closing types, can be four different things. So in this case, um, it's actually, it's thought, sorry, it's Serafina in the car. and the, and the ending is, um, then I bolted his action. So the point of these, it's very quick to fill out. And the point is that you want to look that you use all four types and you don't have an imbalance. If you start every scene with thought in a thriller story, it's probably wrong. Um, same if you start uh, ev every scene in action and it's a quiet romantic story. Um, if you use one over the other or you never use dialogue, these are things that you can change and, and affect the balance. The anchor scene is just a toggle. And here what you're looking for is, do I know who the point of view character is in the first three paragraphs? Do I know the scene timing? And do I know the scene setting? The entry hook here is what is keeping the reader reading? So in this case, whose funeral is it? And the exit hook, why did Serafina run? So you want to look at the beginning and the endings of your scene and see, is there a reason for the reader to keep reading? And is there a reason for the reader to read the next scene? The tension in this scene is that she doesn't want to be there, but she has to be there. There's no real outright conflict. Um, and really the difference between these is tension is the, um, the worry that something bad is going to happen and conflict, it's actually happening. It's a fight in play, it's an argument in play. So one is future, one is, is in the scene. Revelation is something the reader doesn't know. So in this case, Seraphine and Katie are neighbors and they're, they're quite good buddies. So it's important to establish their relationship through it. The backstory is she hasn't spoken to her friend Alyssa in 10 years. So that's an important fact. There is no flashback. You could leave it empty, you can put none. Um, the scene middle, she sees a man staring at her, which is important. The scene climax, she ends and it's an action scene. And then we have the setting one. So here it's at a funeral, but it's vague. So it needs some work. Um, it's day one in the book. So we don't really know the time yet, but we know it's day one. Um, we have a very important object. So sometimes I just put a check mark if I have objects. Sometimes I want to remember when an object is used and I will just, I'll name it. She sees an unknown man. There's no sounds. Um, it's a great place for emotional impact because they're at her husband's funeral and she doesn't want to be there. It's raining, she's touching the urn. It's all in one location. So those are the elements. Um, I know that was a big dump on one thing, but the, the 38 fictionary story elements are key to our whole process. And once you've done these, then the next thing you can look at, we're gonna go over and have a look at the 
at the story arc. And the story arc is um, what it's showing you here is it's showing you the orange line is the imported manuscript and the blue line, it's comparing it to a commercially successful manuscript. And you can see here, this little plot point is probably too far out. So a couple of things I wanna say about the story arc. One is these are our recommendations. So it's about form, not formula. You wanna have it somewhere in this area. If you don't, you need to have a reason not to. And, and there are examples of, of books that are out of place, but you need to understand why your scenes aren't in the right place. And as you go through these um, and you revise, this will actually update itself. So here we have a case where we think that the uh, plot point one is too far out. And so what you would do is you would go back and, and revise the story based on that. And so if we go back, so let's just look here. Plot point one is scene. That's the other thing you can do here. You can, you can read scenes right here. Um, you can just look at, okay, so it's scene 35. So I'm going to go back to the evaluate page and go to scene 35. So it's this scene. Um, so if we pretend that I revised my story and I know where I want this scene to go, you can just take this scene and you see the little hand that shows up. You just click and then let's say, let's just put it there. For example, so you can see this is renumbered. It's probably a bit early in the story, but yeah, let's let's stick it down here. It's probably better. Um, you can see that the scene numbers get renumbered and, and shifted around as you do it. And then if we go back and we look at the story arc, we'll see that it's redrawing and it's changed it. So now I've moved it, you know, that was my bad, but too early. Really, you wanna try and move it somewhere around here. Um, and the fun of editing really within Fictionary is that when you when you make changes, you can actually see the impact on it. You go, oh, look, that's way too early still. Now I've gone the other route and you wanna try and, and uh, revise your story based on that. So next we'll have a look at the word count per scene. So the word count per scene is interesting um, because it shows you how your story is structured in the context of um, the word count in your scene. And you can see in this story, for example, scene 22 here has a huge word count. It's way longer than the others. And so th this structure is something you wouldn't see just looking at an MS Word document. But here we've given you a visual that shows you that scene 22 is way out of balance. And you could, you could then go back and see if you want to revise it. Um, so when the reader reads a scene that's out of balance, the scene is going to seem long for them. They might not understand why, but the story is going to feel off to them. And that's the first trigger then the reader's hedging their way out of the book, which we don't want. So to fix this, uh, we just remember it's scene 22, which again, you can read here if you want, um, or you can go back to the evaluate page. And we look at scene 22 just by um, clicking on it. And here, no, I've cheated and put a Put a mark for myself but what you would do is you would read through the scene and you go okay you're going to look for trigger points did the time change did the location change did the point of view character change and so what you can do here we're going to we're going to make a separate scene from it so we add a new scene below just by clicking the pencil and then add a new scene and then from here where i know this is my new scene i'm just i'm going to select the whole scene down to the bottom and then I'm going to cut it. You can see it's really long by using Command X and it's gone. And then I'm going to paste it here. And now what I've done is I've split the scene into two scenes. And then we can go back and we can look at the word count per scene and we can see if our story is in better balance. So we'll go over to the word count per scene and have a look. And so we can see it's better, but it's not great. So I would keep going through this until I got it to, in this book, I'm, I'm, I'm hovering around a thousand words. It doesn't always have to be the same, but maybe if this was the climax, it would be okay. Um, but in this case, I would want to keep working on it until I got it fixed. Um, okay, so one other thing I want to show you here, I'm going to skip some of the reports just for timing, but 
um, it's the story map. And I love this. And as an editor, I use this all the time. But what you can do is you can select what you want to look at. So say, for example, we want to look, you can get rid of these. But um, if I want to look at uh, entry and exit hooks together, I can add them in. And here, I put notes for myself. So I've put the entry hooks anywhere. I put a check mark. I think, yep, I've got a great one. And anywhere I think, oh, I don't have an entry hook, but I don't want to fix it at the time. I just put none in the story element. Same for the exit hook. And then you can see when you're looking at these um, and you want to go back and revise, it's an easy way to do this. And you can do this with tension and conflict. You can do it with backstory and flashback. You can do your opening and closing types. Um, any of the elements are shown here and you can select the ones that you want. Okay, so that's the story map. Now I just want to flip back to the uh, evaluate page. So from here, we talked a little bit about the advanced mode. And um, what I want to talk about is learning a little bit. So how does Storyteller help you learn? So it's, it's helping you by looking at the 38 story elements and um, the ones you want to consider. So it's, it's, it's not only a platform that creates structure, it's, it's an in the moment advisor that provides relevant information as you revise your story. So if you don't know what an element is, you can click any of these question marks and we'll tell you why it's important. You can click needs more and how to use the element and then writing advice specific to that element. So, it's to help you learn as you go. And it's better than you, you know, it's better than a writing course where you have to remember everything you've learned and apply it to your story or going and searching for advice in a book. You can look right here and remind yourself for every one of these. So that's, um, let me just see if I've missed everything. So we've gone over the manuscript characters, uh, plot insights. Let's just have a quick look at the plot insights. And so here we have the purpose of each scene and you can add purposes, you can uh, have all kinds and here what you're doing. So I haven't added them for the whole manuscript, but this will show you the balance of character introduction versus character development, et cetera. And if you're having a lot of character development scenes happen near the end, that's a problem. Your character should be developed by the midpoint, if definitely by plot point two. Um, and if it's not, then you want to have a look at why you're introducing into developing characters. Could be because you're writing a series. If you're writing a standalone book, it's a, it's a problem and you want to have a look at it. The opening closing types are only going to have a few because I've only set a few, but you can see here in the first seven scenes, I've only used thought and description. So that's not a great balance. You'll be able to scroll through and see the order and you can start looking at patterns that you have in your own writing where on the closing types i've um have a much better balance and so you can look at this and see really how it's how it's impacting your story so let's go back to the overview menu i've got i still have a few more minutes i want to show you a couple of things so that's that's the very high level view of how to edit your manuscript if I go back to the bookshelf, I want to um, have a look at Gone Girl. So Gone Girl, we're going to pretend that there was nothing in here. So let's say this was empty and we're going to pretend that we're Gillian Flynn and we're making our outline for um, Gone Girl. Now I'll tell you flat out, I'm a pantser, but I'd like to do a tiny little bit of outlining. So assuming you have a story idea, what I recommend is you want to name your story and that always, your, your file name always shows up over here where it says Gone Girl. And I recommend writing a blurb before you do an outline, after you have your idea for your story. And the blurb is what would go on the back of a book when you're ready to sell it. And it's telling this, the reader what the story is about and it's a promise. And so as you're writing your book, you want to stay true to that promise. And in your blurb, you want to see that it's clear who the protagonist is. And so as a minimum, when I am doing a, uh, an outline and writing within Fictionary, 
there's the first few scenes where you set up the ordinary life for both Nick and Amy. And maybe you need a few scenes to do this. You don't know this yet. You're just kind of toying with it. Um, I have written a blog that I just thought I would point out, which is on fictionary.co slash journal slash how to write a novel. And this does a deep dive into Gone Girl and how to, how, how may, you know, maybe it could be written, you know, and I just like it because it's a great book. The next thing I do is I look at my inciting incident, my plot point one, my middle point, plot point two, and the climax. And so in um, Gone Girl, the inciting incident is when Nick comes home and Amy's missing. So I've named that scene Amy missing. I know what it means. Plot point one is where he goes to the press conference and uh, sorry, plot that's middle. Plot point one is where he finds the first treasure hunt clue. And this is when he knows that Amy is um, misleading everybody and she's the one driving this issue. And so he knows he has to do something about it. He can't turn back. The middle is the press conference where he figures out he's got to be proactive or he's going to end up in jail. The plot point two is where he's at his absolute bottom in the story where Amy lies about the kidnapping. And so he's stuck with her and has to figure out how to get away from her. And the climax is that he can't leave her because, and sorry about, I should have said spoiler alert ahead of time, um, because she's got proof that he actually did kidnap her. So he's stuck and that's the end. And so once I put in those key scenes, you can then always add chapters before and after. You can um, add scenes. And so you can start building your outline here. And then the only other thing I do when I'm outlining here is not go there, is go to the cast of characters, which you'll see doesn't have anybody yet. So I would go in and I would add Nick and I'll just skip last names so you don't have to watch me type. And I'd add Amy. And then as I'm writing, I would add the various characters. And then on the evaluate page, um, I will um, add them to scenes as, as we go. So you just, you know, same as we talked about before. So we'll skip out of there. Okay, so that is a very quick view of um, doing an outline. And then the very last thing I wanted to show you was uh, pro writing aid. So I'm going to jump over to um, Chrome for a second. Okay, so here, um, same manuscript. Now we're in Chrome. And you can see this little icon here. That's pro writing aid. And you just turn it on. So I have it disabled just to show you how to turn it on. And once you turn it on, it shows up over here. Oops, sorry. There we go. So you can see here, there's a couple of ways you can use Pro Writing Aid. And one is you can make the changes here just by clicking on it. And the other is this beauty where you click here and you can see all of that. Uh, the evaluations of your book from a copy editing point of view, which is just, I love it because now we're doing our story editing and we can copy edit. You can click here and I picked this one because it has a graph and I like graphs. So if you don't know what it is, you can read about your sentence. You can go off and read a full article. And then the other thing you can do is you can open the full editor. And it's just being a bit slow because now I have Safari open and Chrome and Zoom. And then you can edit right here. So, um, you know, my favorite, my go-to is the, is the Grammar Insight. That's where I go first. And you can see if you click here and fix it, it will actually update it in the text in Fictionary. So if you, if you just want to focus on copy editing, you can do it all here and it gets done. So let me just click out of there um and you can see here Ontario is now fixed where where we did it in there so okay that's the last um oh the only other thing I wanted to show you about the coupon is when you um if you do the two-week free trial when you decide it's time to enter a credit card you hit your managed subscription page and then up here, you choose your plan, whether you want it to be annual or monthly. Um, the other thing about this coupon is we put it valid for as long as you're a subscriber, so there's no timeout on it. And you pick your, your 
annual or monthly. And then from here, you would add your credit card. And on that screen is where you're asked for your coupon. So don't worry that when you sign up, the coupon isn't there. All righty. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, I guess the other thing I should say is you can find us at fictionary.co. We've got a YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and put Fictionary in, you'll find us where we do a lot of free training on all of the elements with super short videos. So you can see how to use them if you just, you know, if you're a person who likes to learn visually. So thanks for listening to all that. Thank you so much, Christina. That was awesome. Um, we do have about four questions, technically five, but two users have the same one. So okay. um, if anybody else has questions for Christina, go ahead and get them in now. We're going to begin. Uh, the first one we have, uh, can you have more than one protagonist or can you set more than one protagonist? Yeah, so that is a beautiful question. And uh, I, I realized as I went through it, I forgot to show the character arc. Uh, insight. But the answer to that question is no, there is always only one protagonist. And I'm going to give you a very quick blurb. I've done a full hour long webinar about it. And I'm just about to put out an ebook on why there's one protagonist. So it's a really in depth topic. But to answer it quickly, the three types of protagonists are a single protagonist. So if we think of Jason Bourne and the Bourne identity, he's clearly the protagonist. It's a multi point of view book. So it's written from different characters' points of view, but there is one protagonist. The story is about him. There is a thing called a combined protagonist, which is still one protagonist. It's two characters. And what a combined protagonist means is that every scene impacts those two characters in either a positive or a negative way, the same way. So it could be different positive or different negative, but it's always positive or negative, whether they're in the scene or not. And an example of that is Thelma and Louise. Every single thing that happens in that movie, and I just rewatched it on, I forget what, some watching thing, um, and about it went through every scene, and it's it's brilliantly done in the sense that it's two characters, one protagonist, and so something bad happens, it's bad for both of them. Something good happens, it's good for both of them. And then the third example of a single protagonist is Game of Thrones. So it's written, the very first book is written with nine point of view characters. He's really tight on point of view. If you wanna look at a book that's tight point of view, that's a great one. And it's a single protagonist in the sense that the, the protagonist is the human race, it's the kingdoms against the others. And so every scene is either good for the kingdoms or it's bad for the kingdoms. And so it could be good or bad for different characters, which is the difference from Thelma and Louise. Um, but it's always either good for the kingdoms or bad for the kingdoms. And so the protagonist in that book is the kingdoms and that's it. And so in Fictionary, what you do is you add a new character and you would either call it Thelma and Louise or you would call it the kingdoms. And then when you're evaluating, is the scene good or bad for the protagonist? That's what you're evaluating against. So super deep topic. And um, we will have an ebook in the next month. It's just being beta read right now. And then it's got to go off, you know, be updated and proofread, et cetera. But um, it's a really helpful way to look at protagonists. So okay, our next question. Uh, does Fictionary use the latest edition of Microsoft Word? Um, so it, it doesn't, so you don't work in Word when you're using Fictionary. It's DocX, so not Doc. So you'll see it when you import a manuscript, it has to come from a DocX file. So any of the versions that are DocX will import. If it's a doc file or something else, it, it'll just show grade when you try to import it. You can't actually import it. And so um, what we do is, and we chose DocX because it's an easy one to convert through. So for example, in Scrivener, you can compile and have it export your Scrivener document to a docx file and then import right into Fictionary. Same with Google Docs, you can download into docx and into Fictionary. So um, really, it's, it's just about converting a document. You don't have to open it on your computer. You don't have to have Word. You just have to convert it into Word and import it in and then away you go. Okay, our next question says, I use the 15 beats plot points for romance. Can I, can I adjust the program for that? 
Um, you can, so the way I would do that, so the story arc is set, it's the five key scenes, but on when you name your scenes, I would put those, list them on your scene name. So you put your beats right in there. So you know when your beats are and when you're scrolling down the scene names, you can see it. And also when you look at the story map, you can see it. And that's the way to utilize it. But the story arc's not gonna draw on 15 beats, it draws on the five. Okay, our next question says, can you change which commercial book your story arc compared to? For example, fantasy or science fiction might have a different story arc than a crime or mystery novel. So I'd love this question. Okay, so the answer is no, and here's why. Since the beginning of time, the story arc has not changed on a the way it's drawn. So the inciting incident is always within the first 15%. And uh, we go way back to Beowulf, which is the first Anglo-Saxon book story. It's really an epic poem, but even that, follow the story arc that's used today. And so the inciting incident is up to 15%. If it's later, you need to have a reason why. And the movie Casablanca is a great example where they have a lot of subplots with a lot of tension to push that inciting incident out. And so the, the viewer will put up with it. But you need to be careful if, if an inciting incident is later than 15%, regardless of the genre, the reader is going to think, well, why nothing's happening? What's going on? Um, Plot point one hits between the 20 and 30% mark. Um, and this is where the protagonist can't return. So Harry Potter is the easiest example where he gets off the train at Hogwarts. Um, he can't get back on, it's gone. That's his plot point one, he's got to move forward. Um, the midpoint obviously is between 45 and 50%. And this is really where your character goes from reactive, which is the example I gave in Gone Girl, to proactive, where Nick has to start leading this and doing something or, or Amy's going to win. And it's really, that's the start of the character driving stuff that really then pushes to plot point two, which is should be the scene where the character is at their worst. And that's between 70 and 80 percent. And then after that, you go to the climax, which is you know, 85 to 95 um, percent, which is, of course, the most tense scene. It's the scene that answers the story question that's in the blurb, um, which is why you want to remind you to have the blurb there. So, you know, your climax scene is related to it. Super important. And so literally since the beginning of time, all the commercially successful books have followed the same form of a story. And so that's the form that we've chosen. And hopefully that answered that in a very long way. Our next question, how would you best use Fictionary for third person past tense? So we don't um, look at tense and that's where you use pro writing aid within Fictionary. So it looks at the tense for you. Third person, um, you could have third person single point of view character or you could have third person multiple point of view character. So if it's single, it's like the example I showed you um, previously where I set single point of view character. It doesn't matter if it's first or third. The key thing is it's, it's it, you know, the difference between the two. Um, and for uh, a third person multi point of view, then you just don't set that and you keep track of the point of view characters. And then you use pro writing aid to look at the tenses and make sure that you're consistent within the tenses for a third person. And again, pro writing aid has genre specific stuff too, right? For the actual words and things. So um, you want to turn the genre on within pro writing aid to look at the word level for your particular genre. All right, our next question, does Fictionary work with MacBook? Yes, I use a Mac and you can use it on Safari too. And I own the company, so I'm sure because I'm a Mac user. <laughs> And our last question, does the special discount this week only apply to a yearly subscription? No, it applies to a monthly as well. And as long as you continue to subscribe, it will stay with the monthly. So the monthly is um, normally 20, so it's for 12. And the yearly is normally 200, and so it's for 120 instead. Oh, we had one more question in the chat. Does Fictionary work with Scrivener? 
Right. And so that's that's the same thing. It's, it's a little bit the same as the, the DocX question, whereas Scrivener is, I, I mean, it's a beautiful piece of software and we have lots of writers who use Scrivener. And in Scrivener, there's a compile option and you can compile so that the document exports from Scrivener to your desktop to a DocX file. And the beauty of Scrivener is you can also have it so that when you export, you compile that it starts each chapter with the word chapter and um, it, it'll put your scene break characters in for you. And so it's formatted perfectly for Fictionary. So we love it when writers come from Scrivener because the manuscript just goes boop, boop, and it's in. And someone else just asked, will this work with an iPad Pro? Mostly. So <laughs> um, we haven't officially supported it on an iPad, but we do have um, writers who do use it on an iPad. Some of the visuals are a bit off. Um, you know, it might look a little strange, like the drop down might kind of hang off the bottom or something. So we haven't fully done it there, but we do have users who, who use iPads. All right, that's all of our questions. Thank you so much, Christina, for being here. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, don't forget the discount for, for writing aid users ends this week on Friday. So go ahead and use that link and then code PWA2021 to get your 40% off. Terrific. Well, thanks, everybody. I really enjoyed being here. And um, if you ever want to chat with me when you try Fictionary, you can talk to me right from inside the app and I will answer. All right, have a great evening, everyone. Bye, everyone.